Line up in the morning and stare at your shoes Like meat for a gaffer to pick and to choose With a tap on the shoulder, he gives you the sign You can hump call all day for two shillings and nine I'm telling you Jack, life's not the same When you spend your day alone at hundred uh, When we got together to try and keep the history alive uh, we've got help from different people down through the, the years and uh, the Five Elements Arts Festival uh, introduced us uh, to Neve Gleeson uh, who's uh, a well-known playwright and I don't know how she's put up with us uh, for the last six months. We've been rehearsing and this is the second time uh, we put this on and it's never been the same once. Never mind twice. So how did she put up with I'm just going to give her just a, something tiny to thank her. Because we're running uh, a bit behind schedule, I'm going to get rid of some of the stories. Uh, RT at one stage, when we set up first, sent a crew down to interview us about Strokes and Robin. And uh, we had a private meeting beforehand. So we said we were going to talk about none of the big strokes. Uh, we're going to mention no names. And we'll just tell them about uh, how the women from Rinse and Pierce Street as well couldn't get tights <coughs> because the doctors bought all the tights in order to put the loose tea in, put them over your and put the. And we tell them all these innocent ones. And uh, so they interviewed us for an hour and a half, stroke three hours, we wouldn't shut up. And uh, it was meant to go out on Wednesday night. Uh, and it, was, it didn't go out on Wednesday night, it didn't go out the following Wednesday night. So I eventually rang them up and said, what's the story? And they said, the legal department in our team <laughs> says it can't go out. So there is a tendency when they talk about Dockers to talk about the drink and the stroke and, and a little bit of that uh, that did go on. Uh, but what people forget is the solidarity that was down there. If somebody was going through a hardship or somebody had an accident, how the other people uh, all uh, stood by them. And there's two stories that we've discovered since we started this journey. Uh, and we're definitely not going to tell them tonight because it'll take a night in itself. One is about a doctor called William Deans, uh, who in 1947 saved three people, three crewmen's lives on a ship called the Amasa Delano on Sir John Rogers' Quay. And he got a bravery medal from the Irish state for doing that. And then 12 years later, he was passed in roughly the same spot. And we believe that a person trying to commit suicide had thrown himself into the Liffey. And again, he risked his life, went into the Liffey and saved this person's life. So the history of the Irish state, he's the only person that has two bravery medals. And we maintain that if this person was from Balls Bridge or Fox Rock, there'd be a plaque or a commemoration. But because William Deans uh, was a docker, there's very little recognition, despite his family putting loads and loads of effort uh, into trying to have him commemorated. So at some stage in the future, we'd like to have a, a, a night where we tell, get his family to tell a story. The second one up is, uh, the nicknames are so strong that I didn't forget the real name. So I'm going with Patrick Curry. Patrick Fatsa Curry. Patrick Curry. Uh, so everybody knows the story. Uh, or, oh, I'd certainly know the story. I was working in the North Wall Extension and he came to me and he said, Deco, you have to keep an eye on me today and see what strokes I'm up to. <laughs> and uh, at 20 past eight, he drove past the office, put it up the air. He was under kind of surveillance at the time, so he was immediately stopped by the Harbour Police. He was searched, could find nothing on him and they let him go. 
Uh, half nine on a bike, the same, stopped and searched. It was around the fifth time that I did this. And then around the eighth time he came up and he said, what did you notice? And I said, the first seven bikes were black. <laughs> <laughs> and that fifth one was blue. So he, he, was, uh, he was acquiring bikes. Uh, and he was, he was very proud uh, of that. But then his family uh, researched his life. And we were being kind of aware of it, but uh, not to the degree. And there was a, a history in the First World War, especially after the lockout, of a large number of Dockers joining the British Army, not for any love of the Crown, but in order to feed their family. And the same tradition carried on into the Second World War. And Fatsa Curry joined the British Army and found himself uh, in two different uh, prisoner of war camps having been captured by the, the Japanese. At the second camp he was in, uh, 120,000, was it, it 200,000 to 230,000 prisoners died. Uh, and he survived. And he came back to, uh, to North Wall. And uh, we believe that his story deserves uh, telling uh, much more than uh, what I'm doing. But the, the, the family asked me to check on a particular story. In the middle 70s, a Japanese ship came into port, which was quite unusual. And he went aboard the ship and he asked, could he see the captain? And uh, looking enough for the captain, he was on the bridge, which would have meant that there was other crew members there. And Fatsa said to them, uh, said to the captain, nothing personal, but I have to kill you. <laughs> and he lunged at him and he, they restrained him and instead of walking him off the gangway, they actually threw him into the liffy and he swam to the, the, the ladder, came up the ladder and presented himself at the gangway again and said, uh, nothing personal, but I, I need to kill the captain. <laughs> so uh, here was a man that went through uh, an absolutely horrific existence and uh, at some stage in the future uh, we hope we hope to uh, give him due recognition and to tell the story uh, really well so it's not to depress us all uh, we're going to talk about uh, there was dockers and there was checkers so a checkers job was to check the cargo coming off the ship as it went into the shed <coughs> Uh, and when he was doing that particular role, he was called a tallyman. So a tallyman and the amount of tonnage he recorded was really essential for the docker's pay. I think it was 97 tonne? 96. 96 tonne of general cargo. If the gang achieved that, it put them into a whole new wage bracket. So there was pressure put on the checkers to uh, what would you call it? Be to record a to record a higher amount than possibly that was discharged, and most checkers did that. Uh, they, they bowed to the pressure, but one or two were really rigid. So Paddy's going to tell the story about how they got, here. <laughs> how they got their own back on a checker who was too rigid in his recording. Yeah, well, the ninety-six ton that Declan just talked about. That was the minimum for your day's pay. Uh, and obviously, the dockers, that was called a Mimi. Uh, in other words, you got 96 tonne and you were finished at 5 o'clock, and you got a day's pay, that's it. But because you were paid on <coughs> tonnage, there was different rates, as was said earlier on, for different stuff. Um, for every tonne after that, you got paid X number for each tonne after that. Now, the significance of the 96 tonne was for other significant things that was happening during the day. For example, the rules and regulations. If it was raining and you're stopped for 15 minutes, we say, it would give you one hour. If you wanted the second hour, it would have to be one hour and 15 minutes to put you into two hours. So uh, to make sure that you got this waiting time, uh, 
you had to make sure that you had over the minimum. In other words, you'd have to have more than 96 ton. Um, so, um, this particular checker, very nice man, very highly respected because he was so <coughs> diligent about his work. And um, <coughs> the boys thought they'd put a little trick on him because he wouldn't shift. He was saying it was 95 ton and that was it. Strictly speaking, he was right. But most checkers, as Declan said, if the boys got around you, it suddenly became 97. <laughs> you got your two hours waiting, and that's the idea. So anyway, because Liam didn't, I think it's all right to just say his first name, Liam uh, didn't bow, and to try and make a point, because they want to go on with this argument and say that it was more the day before. So as it happened, there was two elephants coming in from Africa, from the Dublin Zoo, and um, they got one of the elephants came out, so they decided that, you know, to get Liam away from the ship because he was such a diligent man, you had to get somebody to distract him in some way. So it was arranged that somebody came out and said, look at this, something that had gone into the shed, it needs to be clarified, you've got to come in and sort this out. So obviously he leaves, he goes in to the shed, to sort this problem out. And when he's in there, the second elephant comes out. They then quickly take that elephant around the side of the shed, Liam comes out, and he comes out, no, no, you're brand Liam, everything's okay. So then, when the ar argument went on the following day, he was Liam Warren, uh, he, he said, no, 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 95 tonnes, 95 tonnes, just misfortune, you know, that you don't get these weight marks. And he said, he said, you know, who we're talking about here? Talking about Liam, you all know him, he's one of the best checkers we have. So one of the wags says, one of the best checkers you have, said, holy shit, you're talking about uh, this guy as if he's some kind of Jesus Christ. He misses an elephant, <laughs> you, for Christ's sake, you know. Can I ask, how would, how would uh, you be briefed on loading an elephant on the ship? How would you know how to do that? Like? That's a bad way. It's <laughs> <laughs> the wrong way. No, I have to yeah. the, the easiest thing is to ask the elephant. <laughs> Yeah, I never forget, by the way. <laughs> <laughs>
the bear it is free and there's bottles of rum hanging from every tree wrap me up in me oil skins and jumpers no more on the docks i'll be seen and tell me how oh, shipmates i'm taking a trip mates and i'll see you someday round fiddler's green now I don't want a halo or a harp, not me. Just give me the breeze and a good rolling sea. I'll play me a squeeze box as we sail along. With the wind in the rigging for to sing me a song. Wrap me up in me oil skins and jumpers. No more on the docks I'll be seen. Just tell me a shipmates I'm taking a trip, mates, and I'll see you someday round Fiddler's Green. Wrap me up in me oil skins and jumpers. Come on. No more on the dark side of the sea. Just tell me, old shipmates, I'm taking a trip, mate, and I'll see you someday on Fiddler's Green. Get out of the garden. <laughs> Four to drive it, one for to guide, four to fill it in the darkness inside. And he'll work like a miner, shoveling coal, scraping the floor deep down in the hole. I'm telling you, Jack, life's not the same when you spend your day alone at hundred.